Hi, it's Rebecca at Timesmith Dressmaking. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're talking about patterns. Anyone who is new to 18th century uh, sewing projects and costume um, making perhaps considering what pattern to use for your first one so you may relate or you have said one of one of these statements you're looking for a pattern and you're not too concerned about being super historically accurate but you'd like to get the right look or you need it to be an easy pattern uh, based on what you think your skill level is um, or you know that you're planning to use a sewing machine, um, but finishing uh, finishing with hand stitching, or as I often hear people say, that we'll use hand stitching for everything that shows. If you have had, if you've been in that position, uh, wondering where to start, uh, then let's let's talk about patterns. And by patterns, I'm assuming that most people in this position are um, talking about traditional paper patterns that you cut out and lay out on your fabric and generally pin or use paper weights and then cut out your fabric and then assemble all of the pieces uh, together in a certain order. And I'm assuming that the biggest hurdle that you are up against uh, is how to make the outer garments that are fitted, um, the classic beautiful 18th century gowns or perhaps fitted jackets, um, those sorts of garments. So the first thing is to check if you want the right look, that relates to having the right silhouette so that if someone sees you from a distance, they recognize immediately, very quickly, that this is 18th century and not another era, not Victorian, not Elizabethan, something like that, it, that is clearly 18th century. And for that, you need the right undergarments. You need the right structure that will give you the right shape. So you will need to have really uh, ideally, you should have a shift. You will definitely need stays that are the right shape, the right uh, style for the gown that you're making, and uh, a well-fitting, uh, a good a good fit on you. And then also you need to give some thoughts into the skirt supports, the lower body um, structure that produce the elaborate, you know, the fantastic, uh, voluminous fabric shapes of 18th century gowns. So yes, so you'll need stays, uh, shift stays uh, skirt supports and then you probably will want an under petticoat uh, your pet there will be a, a petticoat with your gown and possibly even another under petticoat under that so you could have two or three petticoats perhaps in total I highly recommend that you build up this these foundation garments um, using Burnley and Trowbridge's Sew Along series on their YouTube channel. You'll be able to put together all of the basic unfitted garments, actually mostly without a pattern, it's basic geometry and they tell you how to measure out your fabric and determine how much you need and how to cut uh, and you don't actually need a paper pattern for most of those garments. Uh, Burnley and Trowbridge also have quite a comprehensive series of stitch tutorials so that you know what these stitches are by name and how to do it and you get a chance to practice. If it turns out that you decide you need actual personal tu tuition with stitching, then I highly recommend Sewn Company, Sarah Woodyard at Sewn Company. Uh, for Burning Trowbridge and Sewn Company, I will put links to their websites and YouTube channels in the description below. Right, so you've got all your undergarments and you're ready to start. The three most popular pattern lines for 18th century sewing projects are J.P. Ryan, Mill Farm, and Larkin and Smith, which is also sometimes referred to as at the sign of the golden scissors and sometimes just golden scissors. Um, all of these come from individuals who specialize in 18th century. They are long time uh, living historians, reenactors, costumed interpreters, and uh, historical traders, they are steeped in knowledge of the 18th century. All three of them produce paper patterns that you buy in, that come to you in a packet or an envelope with a set of instructions for making up the garment once you have your fabric cut out. So these are all historical pattern lines. I'm assuming right at the start that you want the right look and the right silhouette. 
So we're not looking at the big non-specialist historical pattern companies like McCall's and Simplicity and Butterick. Those are just not going to produce the right result for you. But if you do find yourself forced to use a pattern from one of these companies, there are a number of places you can go to find hacks that will help you put them together in a better way, a little bit closer to the order of construction, uh, using some methods that will produce a, a more historically accurate look than if you followed the instructions that come with the pattern. If this is you, just let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to steer you in the right direction to get the help that you need to get a better result with those patterns. But looking at the three most commonly recommended historical pattern lines of the 18th century, then the factors you're going to need to consider when choosing are the degree of historical accuracy in the pattern pieces and in the instructions. Uh, one of the factors you'll want to consider too is what garments are included in their lines. Some of them, are, some of them include jackets and gowns, some of them are just gowns. You'll also be wanting probably to balance up your demand, your needs in terms of ease and speed. Um, do you need to do it or want to do it in a way that you learn? Or are you needing the quickest route to, uh, or are you looking for the quickest way to get to the degree of historical accuracy that you want or need for this project? If it's speed that you're after, then you're going to need also to be really honest with yourself about your end goal. Are you going to end up with the correct outfit? In this regard, I've just asked you to weigh up gowns versus jackets. It's tempting to go with jackets because they seem easier and faster to make. But depending on the time, the place, and the person, the impression that you are aiming to look like, jackets may not be appropriate for that. We do not see so many jackets in English culture in the 18th century, which has an impact on American culture in the colonies. However, they were much more common in, the, in continental Europe. Um, and these are generalizations, France and Germany and Holland, for example. However, there are some exceptions in some parts of the American colonies, depending on the cultural um, and ethnicity backgrounds, uh, and also different time periods. Um, earlier in the century, you'll see a more of a mix of jackets. Later in the century, you'll see more of a mix of jackets. But for the bulk of the 18th century in English culture, it was all about gowns. And the same is true of Scotland. Uh, they were wearing gowns, not jackets. Although there are some exceptions there. So those are just things you'll need to wake up, weigh up, is that it's tempting to go with the jacket, first of all, thinking it'll be simpler. But if the end result is a garment that is actually not going to be as historically accurate as you need for your event or, or for your group, um, then it may be a false economy and um, end up being a, a, just a learning experience that you never get a chance to wear. Um, because it's not doesn't meet the end goal. We're now going to look at these three pattern lines with some examples with, by reference to just a few of the patterns that I have from each of them um, in some detail to see their pros and cons and what might be the most suitable for you. So for each of these three pattern lines going to look at some examples and have a think about historical accuracy based on period documentation and or the study of extant garments that may have been made. We'll look at how historically accurate the pattern pieces are, the construction techniques, the order of construction, and whether the instructions are clear and easy to follow, which would make them suitable for beginners. Starting with J.P. Ryan. Here is a very popular style, uh, a gown. Um, it is referred to as a robe à l'anglaise à la polonaise uh, with an with two options, either being an open robe where an under petticoat or a petticoat shows underneath the edges of the gown, or in this case, what they call an apron front. Now, both st styles are um, historically known styles. However, just flag up that they, the dating on this pattern is not strictly accurate. Also, the terminology is um, quite outdated. Uh, research has really um, corrected our understanding of what a lot of the terminology 
um, used here in this pattern refer to in terms of the style. Neither one of these is a polonaise. Uh, and also the, the apron front was not uh, popular really again in the 18th century until the 1780s, which is not what's said in the pattern. However, going for the right shape in the silhouette, provided that you are making these overstays that fit you well, this is a very good silhouette. So I'm going to tick yes, that the pattern pieces to get the right shape and look are pretty good. Go with that. Now, period construction techniques. This is, <laughs> to be absolutely honest, they're not historically accurate at all. This is modern construction, really perfect for making with a sewing machine. It actually assumes you're going to. Um, seam allowances are not um, finished off in the same way. Basically, the actual construction techniques do not allow uh, the seams to be handled in the same way as we see in extant garments. Uh, there are a number of different techniques here that just did not exist in the 18th century. However, those exact features that sort of fail on historical accuracy may be useful for you in some circumstances and depending on what your goal is here. And we'll get to that a little later in this video. So I'm going to have to say not period construction techniques and the order of construction is not historically accurate. Clear and easy to follow instructions. If you're experienced with, or intermediate or experienced with modern techniques, modern construction and modern sewing machine um, uh, sewing, then yes, you probably can get by. There may be some things that are a little unfamiliar in terms of the actual manipulation of fabric, uh, but it's you, you, pretty easy to find help with those things and there shouldn't be anything that really stumps you. So I would say if you are an intermediate, then you're fine. We'll just give a quick look at one of the sheets with the pattern pieces so that you can see it is full scale, full size, uh, and includes seam allowance. And you would simply cut these pieces, lay them out on the grain line indicated, pin to your fabric exactly as uh, with um, any other pattern. The next one is Mill Farm Patterns. This is a different style uh, that I've selected here um, that I have in my own library of patterns. This one is, is quite different from J.P. Ryan in opposite ways. Again, you'll get the right look. This is distinctly 18th century. No fear of it being mistaken for anything else. The instructions and order of construction are based on what's seen in extant garments. So it's quite accurate that way. So we will actually mark up here. Pattern pieces are good. Period construction techniques are good. Order of construction is good. Clear and easy to follow instructions. The instructions are very brief. They are literally two sides of one sheet of paper and then another uh, sheet with um, some options uh, to make variations of this style and some list of um, uh, books uh, that uh, back up some of the research here, uh, which is good to have. Personally, I find these hard to follow unless you already know what the order of construction is. So that puts this into a category that this could be really useful as possibly a second project. We'll come back to that as to how you can use that later on. Um, so I'm gonna say that you would need to be beyond beginner level at in 18th century specific sewing. Um, so I'll just put not for beginners to 18th century. I think it just assumes some understanding that is not um, in, in, explained in detail. The instructions are just very, very brief. And the last one is Larkin and Smith. Uh, I've chosen the English gown to, to show you here. Again, uh, paper pattern um, all comes uh, that you need to cut out. The period pieces are very, very good. Um, as good, if not better than the others. So uh, in terms of the accuracy of the pattern pieces, Period constructing techniques, this is where Larkin and Smith excel. They really teach you period techniques in instructions that are in a booklet of over 30 pages long. It's quite remarkable and that um, gives you everything from background, introduction, uh, choosing materials, fabric suggestions, thread instructions, uh, suggestions, um, tips on preparing your fabric, um, 
And then a full section on the stitches that will be used and the basis for them. They come from period sewing manuals, uh, diagrams and descriptions, instructions on each of these seaming techniques and stitches. And then the construction details. The gown is based on what we see in the, in the original gown that the pattern has been based on. And then the construction details on the reproduction gown, um, including details of the fabric chosen and why. And then, this is lovely, I don't know of anyone else that does this in a, in a paper pattern like this, includes steps on how to make a mock-up, how to make a muslin and to know, assess the fit, to know what to fix in the pattern to make it fit you better. And then, and then gives you construction sequence, like a cheat sheet. As you go through and you're lost in the details, there is this thing you can go back and check where you are in the sequence. Because sometimes you'll think, oh, shouldn't I've already done such and such by now? And there'll be a very good reason why it's been left till slightly later, later in the sequence of instructions. So that's really, really good. This is really for instructions and for teaching, short of taking a hands-on sewing class. This is a sewing workshop, historical methods in an envelope in a booklet um, and is gold standard. So Larkin and Smith, we have period construction techniques, order of construction. Also, it assumes no prior knowledge. You can be an absolute beginner and it will hold your hand, walk you through exactly what to do. So I rate it very highly for please clear and easy to follow instructions. We'll get back to how these can be used in your sewing journey and as you're learning, all three of these patterns may have a role to play for you. So your choice of pattern plays a role in where you go from here in your journey after making your first pattern. Do you want to develop more skills? Do you want those skills to be modern methods, modern skills or historical skills? JP Ryan is perfectly suited to the modern dressmaker but it will not take you forward if you're looking to develop historical sewing skills. So if you make a pattern from JP Ryan and then you want to look at Mill Farm or Larkin and Smith, um, you're not actually going to be any better prepared to use these patterns than you were before you used the JP Ryan pattern. So if historical accuracy is a goal, even if it's a nebulous, maybe one day sort of goal, then using JP Ryan exactly as it is out of the pack is just sort of kicking the can down the road for you. At some point, you're going to want to give a more historically accurate method a try, and JP Ryan won't have prepared you for that or laid any groundwork for that. So why not start with one of the patterns that does teach you the right order that things go together and the period methods to do it? Of your two options, Larkin and Smith is by far the more detailed, much more detailed. In fact, it's pretty much considered the gold standard with full explanations, step-by-step -step instructions, photos, illustrations, even on making a mock-up to, perf to perfect your fit. Larkin and Smith starts at the beginning and assumes that you have no prior knowledge, experience, or skills. So you can use the Larkin and Smith pattern to learn to make historical dress the period way right from the start. And then, guess what? You'll be able to use a mill farm pattern with its generally excellent but much briefer, sparser instructions. If you're hungry for variety, then go back and pick up a JP Ryan pattern to get the pattern pieces, then use the knowledge you've gained from Larkin and Smith and Mill Farm maybe even using the bulk of the instructions step-by-step step to make those garments too. Once you've done all those, you still want more? Onto gridded patterns. So gridded patterns, 
You may have seen these before, heard of them before. They're basically drawings that, sh that lay out the pieces of a garment on a gridded paper. And these are often spoken of as if they're reserved for advanced sewing, experienced dressmakers, his experienced historical dressmakers. But that's usually because people aren't quite clear about how gridded patterns work and how to put them to good use for you. So let's first have a quick look at each of the main sort of five books that just come up often when we're talking about gridded patterns, including one, in fact, that doesn't even have any patterns in it at all. And then we'll talk about how they work and what value they have for you. So first of all, we have Patterns of Fashion 1 by Jana Arnold. That's very well known. Then we have Costume Close-Up by Linda Baumgartner with a couple of her colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg. We have Fitting and Proper by Sharon Ann Bernston. We have The Cut of Women's Clothes by Nora Waugh. And lastly, we have Costume and Detail by Nancy Bradfield. Now, we're going to use similar criteria as we did with the patterns to determine what their strengths are, perhaps what their weaknesses are, what they can best be used for. So starting with Patterns of Fashion 1, the first in Jana Arnold's series, I'm going to look at whether they contain a gridded pattern, whether they contain construction notes, and whether they include instructions for assembly. Now these don't come in a pattern pack, they are collections of lots and lots of different styles. So it's a little different than what you might get, what you would expect to get in a packet of a pattern to make something. So patterns of fashion one. Yes, we have a gridded pattern, but something that tells us what the pieces look like. Do we have construction notes? Oh yes, we have lots. Here is, I'm going to use this one as an example. Here we go, this one. And it gives a description of the fabric, um, the linings. Um, on the pattern pieces, it indicates uh, slash marks, buttonhole stitch around a raw edge, small tuck here. Um, and it identifies the pieces you're actually looking at. Um, even identifies where on this piece of, the, of a front bodice piece, where the sleeve is gonna attach to. That's useful. Notes that a drawstring runs under the trimming from the shoulder piece to the center front to pull in the neckline. So you've got notes about the construction. Do you have instructions for assembly? Where to start, what to do in the order to do them? No, you do not. The details for this particular style, this particular gown is that those drawings brief description here, and a single page with the gridded pattern. The next one, costume close-up. juggle these. The gown I was looking at here, it's a gown and stomacher. Here you have a, the pattern piece is all laid out and a bit of a drawing with some detail there. Um, the grid doesn't run in lines all the way across, so to actually see all those grids, you would need to trace these out and draw the lines yourself. Um, but the scale is here, and they give it in inches on one side um, and centimeters on the other side, but it is to scale, so it's not full size. You will need to understand what the scale is and scale it up if you were to use um, any of this in, in, making a, uh, in making a garment. But we do have a gridded pattern. Construction notes. Yes, we have a few pages of construction notes uh, with subheadings. We've got details here on the fabric, on the, the some basic measurements. Um, we've got materials, uh, some marks of some alterations, some changes over time. We've got some notes on specific aspects of the gown construction, but we have not got anything about the order of construction. What, where you start, which of these bits, the gown construction is categorized by sort of type of you know, construction, sort of um, 
approach. Um, so you've got some, a thing on uh, the bodice back, you've got something on the skirt, you've got something about the stitching. Um, oh, it's a few more pages, excuse me, what about that? Some details on the bodice front, the sleeves, the sleeve trim, the stomacher construction. But that's not necessarily the order that the text is laid out. It's not necessarily the order that you would make the gown in. It's just broken down into components uh, and described in detail there. So we don't really have, right, we don't have instructions for assembly patterns of fashion one, and we do not have, um, we, how do I, how do I want to mark this? With an X. Construction notes, no instructions for assembly. Next. Fitting and proper. And the gown I'm looking at here is actually this gown. We have a couple of pages of description. Gown made this dated to 1740 to 60, and then later altered. So you have a page showing a gridded pattern. This is on a grid. Right, you can see what you've got there. Three pages on that gown. And we have a gridded pattern, construction notes talking about the features that are noted and how they been done but not step by step in order <sighs> instructions for assembly begin to see a pattern here next we have Nora wall which begins to get a little even sparser information one I've selected here has a rough inch ruler down the side and basic skirt outline for the fabric, um, the bodice, the lining for the front bodice and the back bodice together, uh, sleeves, uh, and that skirt, and then a, a line drawing. Oh, and the cuff. But then there's nothing else about that dress, except in the back, in one of the appendices, there are notes for each of the uh, garments featured and all it does is tell you really where it is it says it's a mantua the date 1740 it's a victorian and albert and it's a session number and two sentences it says it's a simple closed bodied gown of heavy white damask the skirt fullness is arranged in deep pleats about one inch apart and meeting at each side waist with an inverted pleat that's it for construction notes extremely, extremely um, brief, very, very brief. No instructions of any kind. I'm taking these in order differently than what's on my sheet here. The last one is much the reverse. Let's see, where did it go, the dress that I wanted to look at? In this book, it's lots of line drawings, including close-up details. And in some cases, right on the inside of the gown, noting, stitching, and oh, lots and lots of details, beautifully, beautifully drawn. But, no gridded patterns setting out any shapes, no step-by-step -step instructions. Um, each garment, it varies as terms, in terms of what sorts of things the author has zeroed in on to talk about and to draw in detail. She, uh, so there's, there's not a systematic approach to knowing that no matter what gown you might pick to look at the same sorts of details are going to be um, shown so that you can compare um, how they were done similarly or differently. It's um, Each one is kind of a showcase with its own approach, beautifully, beautifully drawn. Ah, so that one, there's no gridded pattern. There are lots of notes on style and on construction um, but as very, very brief 
brief notes, not a great deal of text, but you do have some. You have no instructions for assembling. Okay, so you can see some of the similarities and differences here, these five books we've looked at. They don't all contain a gridded pattern, and they don't all contain detailed instruction notes, and none of them contain instructions for assembly. None of them are going to start you at the very first step and walk you through or tell you the order, even even briefly, not even uh, in Mill Farm uh, fashion, um, to, to at least give you headlines of knowing what needs to come before other things and work through them in order. You've got nothing for assembly. A couple of additional aspects to these. The books are featuring existing real life garments. Patterns are more general, um, but the books are looking at uh, garments and each one of them has limitations or as to the scope of what's covered in them. For example, Patterns of Fashion 5 is English women's dresses and their construction from 1660 to 1860. Costume close-up is only garments that are in the Colonial Williamsburg collection. That's just one collection. Fitting and proper clothing from the collection of the Chester County Historical Society. So again, just one collection. The cut of women's clothes is very much broader range uh, in terms of collections dipped into, and it has a uh, a wider range, too, of different um, materials that are referenced, including some fashion plates, um, period paintings, and artwork. It's, um, it's a little bit more like a fashion history textbook, rather than focusing on patterns. Costume and detail are only clothing from the Snows Hill Manor collection, which is now a National Trust property. So again, that's one collection. So you can be looking at limitations uh, geographically, the source, the provenance of these garments. Um, sometimes it, that can have an implication on the class or the social standing or the wealth of the women for whom these dresses were originally made. Um, also the time period. It's going to be kind of self-selecting depending on what's available in there. There is no one museum that has examples of every possible thing that you might want to know or want to look at. Um, they are collections and they have their limits. So what do gridded patterns have in common? The grids have been laid out over or under but they're, overlaid, they're overlaying drawings that were made by someone who was studying an extant garment. So that person was a researcher, not a pattern drafter, and they wanted to note seams, darts, pleats, where things, how things went together. They might have been taking some measurements, um, but they would have been taking care to not stress the fabric some cases these are very fragile um, so they would have been taking measurements and um, estimated drawings in a notebook that were not necessarily accurate they were unable to lay out perhaps the bodice fully flat and smooth and get an accurate accurate shape off of it with those limitations they were still however aiming to sketch out the various pieces in relative proportion to each other and using a grid as a reference for scale first, general proportions second, and lastly to give an approximate guide on overall size. The priorities again, scale, proportions, size. Original fitted garments such as gowns were not made from patterns and nor were they churned out in multiples of standardized, standardized sizes. Yes, that's right. None of the beautiful, intricate gowns that you've got pinned or bookmarked as 18th century inspiration pieces were made from two-dimensional patterns as we know them. The fact is, people came in all shapes and sizes, back then just as now. 
And these beautiful extant gowns were originally made each to fit the unique body of the original wearer. Many then also carry battle scars of later alterations, whether to accommodate changes experienced by the original wearer, or to try and follow changing fashions, or to fit other people later on, or in many cases, all of those things. The end result, therefore, as documented, as documented by a researcher in our lifetime, cannot reliably serve as any kind of starting point to make a brand new garment for a living person today. Instead, the opposite is true. The gridded pattern is the end point. But we today, on sight of shapes drawn out in a way that we recognize as comprising parts of a garment, we straight away think, oh, it's a pattern. I know what to do with that. Because as modern makers, patterns are our most prevalent frame of reference. Translating gridded drawings into a pattern that we can use as a starting point is a modern skill. The makers of the patterns that we looked at earlier have all utilized, to one degree or another, modern pattern drafting methods as a way to translate what they know of extant garments into graded patterns in a wide range of sizes that a modern maker can understand. Trying to use gridded patterns as a pattern involves starting with a real woman who lived several hundred years ago, who looks nothing like you. She's a different size and shape from you. But you're taking her garment and somehow, essentially drafting, usually through a series of several adjustments, trials and errors, trying to draft a whole new pattern that you hope will look like her surviving garment, the garment in a, that's in a museum collection. And you're trying to use that record taken from this long dead woman based on the piece of clothing that she wore as you're doing a really complicated job of altering it for you. That's actually much harder than just drafting a pattern yourself from scratch, truly. Don't get me wrong, it can be done. There are lots and lots of videos and blogs that talk about how to scale patterns. And the people who have worked out how to make it work for them have spent a lot of time, energy, experimentation. They've shed tears, if not blood, in figuring this out. But you know what? A mantua maker of the period would be just as perplexed by seeing these gridded patterns as you are, even more so, because she did not start a new commission with a pattern. She did not reference patterns while making the gowns that she made. And she did not end up with a pattern when she was done. The way that she worked was much more direct. It was easier, faster, designed to be future-proof, and guaranteed to fit. She might copy over her end result as a shape to be passed to her client in case it should prove useful. But shapes cut in the period way have some fundamental differences to patterns as we know them today. I'll get onto that in a minute. So, meanwhile, how can you use books like these? The key lies in whether you already understand the basics of how garments in the period were put together. If you understand a gown, then you can study construction notes and shapes on paper and use details of extant garments that have been recorded in these books to advance your skills, to try new ways of doing similar things. Setting aside how period mantua makers worked, Let's see how all these patterns and books that are available to us today can be slotted together. Having been in your shoes, a beginner myself not all that long ago, I'm going to suggest that if you are a beginner, you can take all these resources, patterns and books in a certain logical order and put them to good use to learn best practice. I'm a flowcharts person. So we're going to start with basic question. 
Do you have some experience with modern sewing? Probably with a sewing machine, probably using the big four patterns, including their costuming ranges. Yes or no? If the answer is yes, you do have some experience, go here. Then we ask, is your primary interest or goal a costume that just needs to look right, but need not be constructed in the period way? Yep, if that's good enough, that's what you're after. Yes, JP Ryan. Go forth and look fabulous. That's what you need. That pattern will work. Those patterns will work for you. Going back though, you've got a little experience. Your primary interest though is you'd like period way. So you've answered, yes, you have some experience, but no, your primary interest isn't about just enough to look okay. You'd like it to be constructed in the period way. Then I direct you to Larkin and Smith. Start from the very beginning. Even if you've never threaded a needle before or are very proficient with your sewing machine, learn as you go, step by step, details, photos, explanations. If you can use a machine, the instructions will tell you where and when that's appropriate and how to do it, what, what changes or adjustments or variations might be needed. It assumes that you're sewing everything by hand, but absolutely machine sewing uh, can fit in with that. And you will finish up with a period correct garment and a solid understanding of how it went together. Once you've done that, are you ready to tackle more projects using your new skills? Want more patterns? Yes! Mill Farm! Go try out some Mill Farm. But don't forget, with those skills, you can go back to JP Ryan. Just take the pattern pieces. Use what you've learned. Same order of construction, sewing methods, seaming techniques. You can make that JP Ryan pattern look historically accurate. Are you ready for more? That's where the books come in. Books that study extant garments give you many more examples and many more, um, uh, just they add to your repertoire of garments that you can make inspired by or even uh, replicating as closely as you possibly can some of these extants that have been beautifully studied in great detail in a range of books. These are not by any, by any stretch of the imagination the only ones, but they're the ones that come up uh, most frequently and that's why I wanted to talk about them today. But before you dive straight into Patterns of Fashion 1, I'd like to go back to the Larkin and Smith level in your journey starting at the very beginning, because there's one book, not a pattern, but a book that I haven't told you about yet. And I personally have found it to be an excellent roadmap on this journey to learning 18th century dressmaking. And it is in fact, the American Duchess Guide to 18th century dressmaking. We haven't got time today to do a full review of everything that's in this book. But as you see the table of contents, we're basically looking at projects of four key styles that had their heyday at various times in the 18th century. And for that gown, each gown, you get what looks like a gridded pattern, but isn't quite. And then you get all of the notes and information on all of the accessories and projects on how to make them so that you get the correct style of cap of apron, of mitts, of uh, hats in, most, in some cases, all the different things that go together to make the right look. So it's not just the gown, but you get the right look that pins it to a particular time and place for a coherent stepping out of a portrait outfit. It starts at the beginning with historic stitches and how to show them. Uh, again, it's like, it's like everything that Larkin and Smith is, but more so. Each project, big or small, has a gridded page of shapes and photographs, background information, uh, discussions of appropriate fabrics, uh, and then step-by-step -step instructions fully illustrated with photographs to walk you through beginning to end in the right order to make gowns, there are some very, very simple 
uh, accessories to be making to uh, like Burnley and Trowbridge do with their sew along to build up uh, your stitching uh, skill uh, so that you get uh, more even stitching and faster. This is um, this is a great way to get started in historical sewing accurately and to get a good understanding of how it works. But there are four particular reasons I want to recommend this in your journey as a beginning 18th century dressmaker wanting to learn historical techniques. Number one, the order of construction that's taught step by step in this book is founded on period principles, but has been adapted in just a few very crucial ways to enable, to enable you to make garments like the gowns in the period way, but acting as your own dressmaker, doing most of the fitting yourself. In fact, with practice, you may even be able to do it all yourself. Although, to be honest, the shoulder parts always go faster and with much less frustration if you have a helper. Number two, the use of single size diagrams. They're not graded like patterns. So in this respect, they resemble the gridded patterns in Jana Arnold and, and other books. Unlike a pattern, these are... Uh, shapes drawn in a one size um, that you will then use with key fitting points to produce your size. So they're not graded for any kind of size. These are made to adapt to fit you. They're not a particular size, so they're not pattern pieces. In fact, what they really are, are shapes. They're basic shapes as they would have been draped, drawn, and cut as a process on a real person. That's the period way. And then the book gives step-by-step -step instructions, very detailed, full, lots of illustrations and photos to follow along, beginning to end in the right order, in the period correct way. I've talked about shapes looking at this. What do I mean by shapes? Commercial patterns are drafted using fairly modern pattern drafting methodology that involves creating the pattern and grading it into various sizes using mathematical formulas that are fairly standardized in today's pattern industry. Now the good historical styles are going to create the right styles for fitting over period garments, with your stays being the critical garment, but the method of translating the original pattern into different sizes is pretty much along the lines taken by any pattern maker today. While the gridded patterns in books, as we've discussed, only tell you roughly what one person can and did wear on her body. Shapes, however, are the secret that unlock period mantua making. When dressmakers made bespoke period clothing using a particular approach, not too unlike modern draping, but unlike modern draping, they understood the style and could re reproduce that onto a body and use certain key areas to ensure the perfect fit. But how do you get shapes? That's the real skill of the mantua maker. And that I'll be delving into even more in future videos.